All right, welcome everyone. My name is Jeff Skipper, and with me is Jen. 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 Sorry, Jen Fram. I was very bad at this. I will caveat with it six o'clock in the morning, and I've only had one coffee. So you know, Jeff, you keep prompting me on that. I will. I will. I got you covered. So you know, from uh, from a casual conversation, Jen and I said, let's talk about what we've done. We know there's lots of folks interested in. What does it take to put together a book? And we thought, well, we can have some fun talking about our, our stories and bringing that to fruition. Um, as we get started, I'm going to ask, even though you can turn on your video and microphone, I'm going to ask you to not do that, not because we don't want to see your smiley faces, uh, but just so folks can, can focus on myself and Jen within the Teams interface. But we do encourage you, please do use the chat. We'll be monitoring that as we go through. It is just Jen and I, so we didn't bring in a moderator. So it'll be a bit casual today, but we really do want to hear your questions and make sure we get those answered. We've got a bit of an agenda that we'll, we'll go through together. So to get things started, maybe some quick introductions. I'll begin. So um, I've been working in the area of change management for over 25 years. We go through my career. Uh, I reside in Calgary, Alberta, just an hour east of the mountains, just depends how fast you drive. And I focus as well on areas of strategy, uh, executive development, and whatever the clients feels like I could do for them, I'm game to actually attempt it. So that's a, a very short nutshell about me. I'm sure I'll reveal more as we get into the book writing process. Jen. Fabulous, thank you. So for the folks uh, from Australia, I am joining you from Wanjeri land uh, of the Woiwurrung people, which is in the inner west of Melbourne, Nam, Kulin Nation, uh, Australia. And when I think about country and place, I'm really mindful at the moment, specifically right now, that I'm really close to the Maribyrnong River. And Maribyrnong is an Aboriginal phrase for I can hear a possum. Now, this morning, we may not be hearing possums, but as the dawn breaks over on the side of me here, we're probably going to hear quite a few magpies caroling. So I invite you to remind me to hit mute if, <laughs> uh, if Jeff is speaking, so that's not too distracting. Um, I'd like to pay my respects to elders past and present and their connection to land and water, and particularly to any Indigenous people who are joining us today or who might, may be watching the replay of this video. Now, for our friends in New Zealand, it's about eight o'clock in the morning, so kia ora, um, na iwi Maori tangata whenua e te roa. Welcome. So, Jen Fram, uh, Change Consultant, change manager for over 25 years and now the co-founder of the Agile Change Leadership Institute. So we develop capability and confidence in people seeking to land change in a very fast moving world. There's heaps about me online so I'm going to keep it very short with that and you're all very welcome to connect with me on LinkedIn if we're not already connected. Same, same. Um, Jen, while I've got the microphone, tell us a bit about your books. Right. OK, so I have three books now. Um, 2017, we had Conversations of Change, a guide uh, to managing workplace change. This was really about how to help managers who have been given the accountability of introducing change um, and giving them a ready reckoner to what are they in for, what do they need to focus on, um, and what might be the future of their work when they're looking at uh, being responsible for change in the workplace. And then in 2020, we had the Agile Change Playbook, which is a very different type of book. This one is quite an instructional um, and visual type book, which really helps change practitioners come to terms with what do they have to do if they get landed on an Agile project or in an organisation going through agility. Then 2021, we have Change Leader, which is effectively a love letters to, to, to leaders who are emerging from a pandemic and trying to work out how do they lead in this new environment uh, where everything has changed. So the synopsis is change leader. To lead change effectively, you have to change yourself first. So this is the changes they need to make first. There you go. For myself, uh, Dancing with Disruption came out in March. 
Uh, so still relatively fresh. I'm just in the process of doing a bunch of PR work around that. Seems it really never ends. Um, and the, the concept for that was really writing about um, the lessons learned that came out of the pandemic. And, and we're going to move in now into what was some of the inspiration or, or thoughts behind you know creating our book. So I'll kick things off by saying I, I really felt I was taking a risk. I got to tell you the number of times I debated should I really write a book that's based on the pandemic as a case study? Because no one really wants to talk about that anymore. It's over. It's sucked in a lot of ways. So do I want to look back at it? But in terms of case study, it's just it had such massive potential as something global. It asked every kind of stakeholder you can imagine to do something different. And there were so many lessons learned that came out of it. We saw everything from you know things done well, leaders stepping up and, and leading by example, to the opposite of saying the worst things possible on public television, uh, giving incorrect advice and how that impacted people and their ability to embrace change. So, um, but, but I really felt like I had this in me, something that, needed a story that needed to be told around how all of us successfully navigated change despite some of those mistakes and what we could learn from that history so i i really couldn't stop that train from coming i needed to write it jen what about you yeah i just i put in the chat i think that's amazing because it's such an important historical marker mm. um and you kind of touch on on one of the things that really plagued me in writing my books. And so I never ever had ambitions to write a book. I had written two theses. So I've got a, a doctorate um, and did an honours degree before that. So I know the pain of writing big, big things. Um, and people, I've been blogging since 2008. And so again, I wrote constantly and people were always asking me, when are you going to write a book? When are you gonna write a book? I'm like, oh, why would you do it? Like, seriously. However, I got to a point in my career where I was seeing such incredible consistency in the questions being asked by um, managers that I was coaching that I got to the point of I was really bored with answering those questions. And I thought, well, hey, if I had a book that actually answers those questions. I could <laughs> you point at the book. book. Yeah. Read the book. Read the book. Um, and so I think that was the motivation for the first one, Conversations of Change. It was, you know, how do you scale Jen and her advice? Um, the Agile play Change Playbook, it was very different. There was an urgency to it. We had lost all of our work because of the shutdowns. So Melbourne was the biggest city for shutdowns, lockdowns through COVID. We had just started Agile Change workshops um, and all of them were cancelled. And so there was a very pragmatic, how do we keep cash flow going through? But how do we continue this work? We just started to teach people how to do agile change. Um, and so we took the content from those workshops and turned that into a playbook. Change Leader, um, it, again, really no desire to write a book, but a conversation with an executive who rang me in distress about November of 2020. And she was talking about how, you know, all the leaders, and she's she's at a board level, all the leaders she know have no idea how to move forward and they realise that what they've been doing doesn't serve them any well. And it, it was actually really funny because I had started Change Leader in 2018 and Brené Brown's Dare to Lead came out and I went, forget about it. It's already been written. There's no point. And, uh, and when that woman called me and I thought, oh, actually, I've got a lot of it already in that shelved book, wouldn't it be interesting if I looked at that through the lens of the pandemic leadership um, and made it a point in time book, would it offer value? And I guess more to the point, she'd never heard of Brene Brown. It really challenged <laughs> me to go, you know what? There's people who've heard of Jen Fram and not Brene Brown, so maybe I can help them because they're not going to be fine to dare to lead. You yeah. said something really interesting in there, and, and people need to know this. What happened to me as well, there was actually a book before I wrote Dancing, and I had the concept all mapped out. I was excited about it. And um, when I ran it by some people, they said, Jeff, this already been written so many times. And it did convince me. I, I It really um, was a blow to my inspiration. And, and all of a sudden, I felt like I couldn't write it. There's just too many headwinds. But what Jen just said is important. Sometimes it's still worth writing, even if it's been done so many times. Your perspective is always different. 
And that's actually what kept me going when I was writing Dancing is, Jeff, you know, everyone's kind of read and looked at uh, the pandemic and like, yeah, but I have something to say about it and it's important. Yeah. So I'm doing it regardless of what you say. So so you sometimes the, the concept has to be set aside or abandoned for whatever reason. Uh, but then hopefully the next idea comes along or you get that inspiration like you had that prompts you to write it anyways. Yeah. And so I think that's, you know, for people who are thinking of writing a book who are on this call, that's one of your first challenges. How will your book make a difference? So what is it that you can bring differently to perhaps a topic that's been well published? Right. Well published just tells you that there's a there's an appetite for it, right? Correct. So that's a good sign. But you need to think about how does your voice change this topic? I want to pick up on something else you said. Um, you said, you know, you'd been writing a while. You'd done your honors thesis and same. I'd done an honors thesis for my undergrad. I wrote a thesis for my master's degree. Uh, and then uh, during consulting, I started my blog, which was at first monthly. And then I, I can do this and went to weekly. And that practice of writing consistently made it much easier when it came to the, the, the book. You kind of knew, yeah, you get barriers sometimes, but you maybe take a pause back away and then come back to the topic. But that was exceptionally good training for writing a book. What do you, yeah. what's your comment? Uh, this, uh, you know, I know one of the things we we're going to talk about was like writer's block. Um, which I've never really experienced, but I think I've never really experienced it because, <coughs> excuse me, when you're being um, coached in preparing your thesis, one of the things they tell you is you write every day, right? You write every day if it's only 100 words and if there are 100 crappy words, you write every day. Um, yeah. And so that's a discipline that actually takes you through when you actually don't have much quality to produce. Uh, it's always easier to go back and edit than it is to stare at a blank page. Just yes. write hundred crappy words. Right. I've got, um, I keep a Google, various Google documents on different topics and in them you'll find what I call stubs. So I've started writing on something, it's a concept, or I had a, a thought or an inspiration, bam, it's in there. Sometimes I, I bang it in while I'm at the gym just because it's on my mind. And it may or may not turn into something, um, or I'm like, oh, it's not really working for me right now, I'll come back later. And it's the same with chapters. I started writing mm -hmm. chapters and went, it's not quite coming, I'm gonna go to the next one, I'll come back to this later. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, what what did you do? So you, you got feedback around it's been done before, et cetera. Um, what did you do to validate it as actually I'm going to push ahead other than I really want to do it? <laughs> um, so I did cheat. Um, so some of you know this already, but to, to get a significant amount of the writing done, I uh, shipped myself down to Cabo, Mexico, uh, for a couple of weeks and then just wrote and and was able to get 80% of it done. So actually avoided uh, contact and feedback from people uh, pretty much until the uh, editing process began. Now, I will say I've started my second book and I'm doing it completely differently. So as I'm writing a chapter, I actually have a team I'm putting it in front of and asking them, what do you think? How might you improve this? Does this resonate? Um, and they give me all sorts of feedback, which has, I think, really improved the writing significantly. And now I would not do a book any other way. Um, so so that's an option is get together a group of folks who are interested in the topic and ask if they'd be willing to look at advanced um, elements of the text and give you feedback. And that's I love it. It it's provides really good support as well because you basically have a cheerleading squad. I love what you've said there, and I really relate because there's a time and a season for both. So right. um, conversations have changed. I'm a huge mind mapper, right? So in terms of how to get started, it was started with coloured pens and big A3 in a very luxurious hotel room. I took myself to another city and where I didn't know anybody and mind mapped it all out in this beautiful, comfortable hotel room. Um, a month later, I then went to a beach house because it was a public holiday with a group of friends. They had to go out each day and play. 
but they were my accountability team. So they would come back at 5.30, start the cocktails and say, right, Fran, what did you get done in terms of set myself some really concrete, um, you know, goals around right. what right. pulled together. But I think, and I've made a note, the state change is really important, whether it's Cabo or, you know, um, a, a beach cottage or a fancy hotel, there's something really powerful about getting out of your regular environment to get in the space of pulling a book together. Mm -hmm. We also have always, um, conversations of change I did differently to the other two. I published uh, excerpts of chapters as articles on LinkedIn yep. as they finished. And it was kind of a work out loud strategy. I was interested in, well, one, the crowd, you, you, you're you effectively crowdsourcing fact checking because right. people would be right. going, no, you're wrong with this, or here's the reference or that kind of thing, which was beautiful. Yeah. But you also got a sense of what was really resonating for people and what was not. So um, that publishing publicly in draft, whilst terrifying, um, was really effective. And then all of the books, like you, Jeff, we've had a group of people and now here's the trick um one they know the domain two they're well read so they're used to reading books but three they're courageous enough to stand up to you and tell you your work is crap yeah. so it's really important not to have your fans be your testers you actually need people who are discerning who can go, actually, that doesn't, you know, I don't like the way you phrase that, or I think the language here is difficult to understand. You need people who are actually confident enough who can um, stand up to you and tell you, yeah, nah, back to the drawing board. Yeah, I think that's that's very wise. Um, and, and it also gets to the fact that you do need some self-esteem going into this because there is going to be criticism along the way. Um, and again, as I noted earlier, that that was part of what shut down my first book idea. I felt criticized and then, uh, you know, it just deflated uh, uh, my interest in writing it. Uh, when I started writing Dancing, I was very motivated and in a very different place. Lots of successes. And, I, you know, it's a habit for me now. Reflect on your success. Things go wrong, but reflect on your success. Um, even just getting to the end of the day and saying, I'm not satisfied with the writing, but I did crank out a fair amount of it. I'll be able to use it. You just keep focusing on success and that helps keep your self-esteem, your confidence up because you will need it as you go through that feedback and editing process. Yeah. Um, you talked about how much you needed to write. I was curious. I wrote this down as a question for you. I know my table of contents did change somewhat significantly as I was writing and wanted to know about your experience. Mm, no. Pretty solid. <laughs> I, think, uh, I, I was thinking about this in preparation for this and I remember with my PhD thesis or doing my PhD, I did it in exactly three years because I pushed my supervisors from uh, I, my project management head was like, no, there are milestones, we're hitting them. None of this, it can take six years business. It's three years and we're out. And I think I take the same approach with the books is that once I get clear on what the structure is, and I'm very, very structural, right? So I mind map, I get clear of the flow, the structure. I get to a level of this chapter needs 4,000 words, which means it's going to be 20 paragraphs, which means each paragraph is probably going to be about 200 to 300 words. So I really chunk things down. Mm -hmm. Um as a way, as a process, um, there wasn't much that changed in any of them, like if I think about it. So, and I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, or like whether I'm too committed to, uh, it's, it's once the train has left the station. Yeah. Like, <laughs> <laughs> well, it's legit. That, that same counsel was given to me of, you know, don't fear I have to write 12 chapters, break it down and say, but that looks like, you know, say, you know, five headings within a chapter. And then, you know, if you write two headings a day in the content for those and you just do the math, if you, you know, consistently over weeks, you will get to that goal of having cranked up what you're looking for. What I yeah. found, it, so I wanted to do that, but I what I found was my brain wanted an organic experience. So if I started going off on a tangent, I would just let it flow, write it and see, does this fit in somewhere? Do, do, do I need to adjust to accommodate for that? 
that did mean I sometimes wrote redundant information. And so during editing, there was a lot of cutting for me. Mm -hmm. um, now I'll throw this out as a little tip. One of the ones that was given to me was keep all those items that hit the cutting floor because they may become bonus material when you're doing your marketing. I didn't end up doing that, but I do have a bunch of uh, bonus material I've yet to leverage. So for me more, uh, you know, I just wanted free flowing and then new patterns would emerge sometimes. So I would change my structure and it, that felt satisfying to me. But the way you did it, Jen, is actually what I was taught to do. Yeah, yeah. I think though, in reflection, so as I mentioned, you know, like Jeff, um, prolific blogger, my free flowing organic pattern exploration happens in the blog posts. And so I think, what actually happened, conversations change, came, it was easy to write because I'd already written 30, 40,000 words in blogs. Um, so for me, it feels like we get to an inflection point or a, um, you know, a punctuation point. I might write for two years of blogs and then I look at them and I go, hey, these actually fit a theme and I've been writing to this problem for two years. There's my 30,000 words. Now let's make sense of them. Um, change leader, the same thing. When I looked back at the previous 18 months, and that's why I'd started it with the, the previous book, my right. blog posts all end up in change leader. So now, is that efficient? Is it lazy? Oh, or has that been my organic process? Have I taken actually three years to write the book, not three months? Um, because that's where it's coming from. Well, I would say that the 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 blogging, vlogging process for me, I'll look for you to comment, that is, um, we're developing our ability to generate thought leadership. That's the point. I want to get stuff out in front of my audience that's useful to them, that resonates with them. Now, if it doesn't, that's okay. It is my testing ground. Um, but I'm trying to generate something that's useful. So, of course, it's good content for pulling together and into the book. So, there's no question. Same for me. Um, you can yeah. even go onto my site and find that there's you know, what we would call lead magnets on there, free downloads. That concept, it's in the book because I wrote it, you know, a couple years ago. It still works for me. I use it in in speeches with organizations, in my consulting, and I'm not going to change it because it works. So yeah, it's in the book. So I agree. That's not cheating. I think it's us developing our ideas. Yeah, um, I can see a question from Lisa, which Lisa, I'll mm -hmm. get onto that in a moment. The other trick for those of you who are already blogging, um, the other thing to look at is your Google Analytics. That will tell you which content is really working for people and people are sharing and, you know, um, so you might want to think about looking at what are your, your top performing posts to go, okay, that's what people want to consume. And so again, it's more data, right? You're using data to inform right. what is was happening there. Um, Lisa, Jeff, I'm going to throw this one to you. Is there a good sure. way to manage possible overwhelm, breaking down writing a book into writing a paragraph, chapter, et cetera? So we've given I, a structural answer. Yeah. What's the emotional response to overwhelm? Uh, well, I think first to acknowledge it does happen. Um, now, if you uh, land a deal with a commercial publisher, you probably have a deadline associated with that as well. So that really adds to it. Um, I self-published, which took that away. The main driver was me. And at the end, I was the one pushing, saying, I want to get this thing out the door. I'm tired of going through the editing process. Let's, let's just launch already. Uh, but that does add uh, some pressure. It is frustrating when you have a day where it's just not flowing or you realize you've been really distracted and done everything but writing. Um, so that is a reality. Um, Jen's commented on it. Um, having some accountability partners is really helpful. They're going to push you a bit. They're not going to beat you up necessarily, but it's push you a bit, be encouraging uh, to help keep you on task. And then I agree, it is the disciplines of saying, I've blocked this time out during the day, I'm going to write. And then you, whatever works for you, you air gap your computer, you're definitely shutting down all the other applications. Uh, you're just not available so that you can focus. But there is a bit of an emotional roller coaster during this journey, that's for sure. Yeah, 
Definitely. Um, Lisa, then in, in Melbourne, um, there's a fellow um, who is rather fabulous by the name of Trevor Young, who publishes on content marketing and stuff like that. He um, has published multiple books. And I remember him telling me right at the beginning um, that one hack to the overwhelm is to um, organise the cover of your book really early and get that printed out and have that up on the wall by your computer because effectively mm. what you're doing is you're, you've got a vision in front of you and anything that you do is advancing that book cover coming to life. Um, and, yeah, you can change your book cover, but just having one really early with your name and your working title, um, really effective. I can yeah. see there's a... Yeah, I'm, I'm going to let you read that long one. I'm going to throw it another aha for me uh, for those who are thinking about writing because it was a significant insight as you're looking at this this pressure of generating content one of the issues one of the the beliefs that worked against me is that i looked on my bookshelf and i'm looking at it over here and i see all these thick books and i thought i had to write a thick book um and jen could probably do the same um if you can see that it's pretty thin yeah and so during the process, I realized, hey, I am writing good stuff and it is practical. It doesn't have to be long. And in fact, I think I'm doing um, a real favor to my audience by getting to the point well. Um, so please don't have any uh, preconceptions around it. it has to be a certain length. All of those assumptions are out the window these days anyways. You'll see books of all different durations on the market. Yeah. Yeah, um, spot on. Conversations of change was 50,000 words. By the time I got to change leader, I knew people's brains were fried and so it wasn't going to be more than 20,000, but you're doing them as, you know, it's a gift. It's a gift to be able to consolidate your thinking in a way that um, can be, you know, uh, consumed easily. So, and mm -hmm. I, I think if you've, if you've ended up writing 80,000, consider that that's four books because, this is the other thing, and we'll probably get to this later, but it took um, three years to get to a thousand books sold with conversations of change. By the time I got to change leader, it took three months. So the more books you publish, people become familiar with you and consume it. So don't be afraid of having enough for four books in a manuscript that you can just go, okay, every short Chop month, up. I'm going to release a new book. Um, Jeff, the question is one of self-publishing versus the um, publishing with a publisher mm -hmm. process um, in terms of, I guess, I'm, I think that question is kind of getting to what are the steps, but what's probably there's a decision making around should you self-publish or should you shop for a publisher? What was your thinking? Um, I, I'm going to be very transparent here to say, you know, I avoided the potential challenge of having a publisher shoot down my concept. I'll, I'll be very straightforward with that. Um, like I said, I was motivated. I'm writing this thing regardless. And I said, you know what? I'm going the self-publishing route. Uh, part of the part of what I used to bolster that thinking was the fact that in terms of royalties, there's a significant difference. There's more money going into your pocket. Think, like, why not? I'm putting all the effort in. Um, and I wanted full control and I wanted full ownership, i.e. copyright over the material because, um, you know, the, the publisher owns your book. Um, and if it's not being printed anymore, that that raises some new challenges for your own book. You can have it published ad infinitum. So there yeah. to me, there were a lot of advantage for that. Jen. Yeah. Um, so similar to Jeff and I'm really comfortable saying conversations of change. Um, one, I'm a control freak, so I was really nervous about losing control of my ideas to a publisher's requirements. Two, I was terrified of being rejected and pitching and being told, yeah, no, not interested. Um, I was too thin-skinned to cope with that process. Um, and three, I'd seen self-publishing was starting to build and I'd seen a few people publish books and do really well with it by themselves. So... I kind of felt empowered that it was not unreachable. Um, Agile Change Playbook is ridiculously niched, right? It is right. never going to appeal to um, 
a, a, a general audience, so there was no point going to a publisher. It's also a visual playbook, which is not like anything else out there. So the time it would take to explain that to a publisher would be too long. Um, change leader became really urgent. I had to get it out in the first quarter of 2021 for it to make sense. Right. And I knew that to move it into a form, I had more confidence then about shopping it. Um, and I actually did some of the proposals, but then I went, this is going to take us to the end of 21 and it'll lose its, its urgency. Um, whereas by that stage, I had learned how to even to typeset. So um, it became really, really self-published as opposed mm. to using other people to typeset. Back to the question in the chat. So the, if you choose to go down a publishing route, um, when you go to most of the business press publishers, you will find um, that they have a page which explains the process. You have to do a proposal which says who's the audience, what's your background, why would you, why would people, you know, read it, um, what the core concepts are. So there's, a, there's often a very structured proposal that you send off to a publisher where they evaluate it to work out whether it's something they want to bring into the fold. Now, some of the business publishers also have a bit of a vanity service where if you pay $30,000 to them, they will take your idea and they will have it turned into a book um, and distributed through them. There's still merit to that because if you go through a proper publisher, you're going to have a much, you know, you'll be able to take a photo of yourself next to the bookstore in the airport, right? right. Um, but you paid $30,000 for the privilege. So as opposed to, you know, perhaps the, the cost that Jeff and I incurred in self-publishing. So the benefits of a publisher is distribution. Um, yeah. If you are inexperienced with writing, you're going to get a lot more uh, help from an editing process you'll have someone step you through the the, the, the whole process as well. Um, so I think that's really good if you are new to writing. Um, if you're a control freak, a sensitive petal and relatively confident, I'd go the self-publishing. Yeah. I'll, I'll throw in there from talking to others that have gone the, the commercial route with a, a publisher. It's not always the same experience. So you actually can't assume that the publisher will provide a good editor. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure Jen as well has seen some books hit the market and they've got the name brand on the side and they still have some pretty glaring issues in them. Um, someone has actually asked about the editing process and absolutely I hired someone and they were phenomenal. I am a good writer. I'm, I'm, I'm quite good with my grammar. Um, and I use the tools. Grammarly is my favorite just to iron out any issues. They still found stuff awkward wording or they could simplify something that was too long. And um, I really appreciated that. So so I, you know, I big thumbs up for my editor. She was fantastic um, in really polishing the, the finished product. So I would highly recommend that. Yeah. Um, editing. Oh. So my mother is a published author, was very famous in the 80s in science fiction and horror, and then worked as an editor um, for academic journals. And I'll tell you what, when you've got your mother editing your work, it takes family relationships to the next level. Because um, I'm quite sure that a professional editor would be a lot more kinder to you in their feedback than your mother is. Um, but having said that, she did an amazing job and it's it was actually really beautiful because it becomes, you know, she she understands my world so much more for having edited the books. Right. Um, I did pay a second uh, editor to review it because it got to a point when I was like, okay, I just want someone a little bit independent um, to cast their eye over this and look at it from a, you know, contemporary book process. So um, you need a really tough skin for the editing process. Um, yeah. But again, yeah. I think thesis writing teaches you not to get emotional about the editing. You just look at it and, and, and you always have choice. Do I take this feedback or do I not? Mm -hmm. Now, if it's grammatical, you probably want to take it. Right. But if it's a question of the language you've used, the way you've explained it, you have a choice of do I accept this or do I go, actually, no, I'm going to stick with what I did. So um, I think that's important that there's choice in there. It is because we all bring our own style to the table and there were changes I rejected because I no, I wanted to say that in a specific way. That's my voice and yes. good editors respect voice. 
Um, yes. And that, that's an important part of your criteria. It's worth mentioning, um, I actually was able to, quote, interview editors, and what they would do is take a sample of your book and edit it and say, this is what my editing looks like. That was really helpful to see, you know, like, wow, you just, I mean, it was good. Now it's so much better. Oh, wow. That would be so cool. Mm -hmm. That would be so cool. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Um, Natasha's asked a question about book coaches. Um, I didn't use one. There are a heap of book coaches out there. Yeah. I actually don't know what they charge. I know other people who have used them and found them really, really helpful. They're not, I'm I'm pretty self-motivated. And as you probably gathered, the control freak, the project management mind um, didn't really need the, and, and you know, the, the thesis kind of meant that I didn't need a book coach. Um, but I think it's, um, I think it's worth looking at if you don't have that background. Jeff, had you, because you can go to writers retreats too, right? So there's writers you, you retreats can, out there. Um, I'm part of a community where they offered a, they call it a writing sprint um, and, uh, and two parts. One is to get your proposal together. So if you're going to a publishing company, you need a proposal for the book, what is going to be out and how it, you know, how it would be marketed, what your network is like and who you could market it to to enhance sales, all sorts of things that. And then um, I also was part of a writing community to help um, actually get your ideas out, start writing. Actually, that did not work for me. I felt constricted by that. So you kind of have to figure out what works for you. Yeah. Um, I'm going to throw in here because I don't want to forget to press paste. Someone's asking how to find an editor. This site was recommended to me. I haven't used it, so I can't personally <laughs> attack. Look at that. We both did the same thing. Um, so maybe you did, but um, that's come up. There you go. Twice now of a resource for you. Yeah, yeah. And I, I did use Readsy. Um, I think on the typesetting, I used Readsy on the book covers. Um, yeah, so I think it's it's worth looking at, definitely. So maybe we'll use that to leap into the, the publishing process. We've talked about editing. Um, you talked a bit about covers. I hired someone who did covers specifically, so knew the format that would be required by, I used Kindle self-publishing, specific yeah. formats. Um, and they gave me, I think, eight options to choose from, which was fantastic. Um, yeah. So I felt like I was well taken care of and felt really good about the final choice. They just wanted con some conceptual ideas and ended up coming up with something completely different off my radar screen, and I loved it. Um, and that became the book. What about you, Jen? Yeah, I'm going to preface this with all conversations about publishing, <coughs> like once we get into this point of the process, not the writing the book, um, it's just traumatic, right? You just have to accept that this point of typesetting, of book covers, of all of that is it's just so painful. Yeah. Um, so, Jeff, you did the right thing. The first conversations have changed. I went to someone who didn't have experience with book covers but was a graphic desi designer known to me. Um, I'm not, uh, you know, and so there were problems then in actually making it work with the printing. Um, so I think it is important to find a book designer who is familiar with wherever you're going to print it or, or publish it through. Um, I'm not in love with Conversations of Change um, cover. It was probably, you, like yourself, I got about eight. It was probably the best of them, but um, with time, I'm not in love with it. Um, I do love the Agile Change playbook. However, that's my co-author, Lena Ross. She mocked that up on a PowerPoint and she mocked mm -hmm. up the design of the internal pages on a PowerPoint. Um, so we were very, very precise with the graphic designer to say, this is what we want, um, yeah. and particularly with the internal page layout. And um, so, that, again, <laughs> all you're going to take away from this session is how much for Control Freak is Jen Farm. Um, <laughs> change leader, um, I did get someone who'd been recommended as a book cover designer, felt like all I got was like clip art kind of yeah. images back at me. I designed Change Leaders. Well, I've just put it down and lost it now. Um, I actually got onto Canva. Canva has a template for book covers, right? Yep. So, um, 
go hard. And so I did that because it was better than all things I was getting and sent it to the graphic designer and said, right, just do that. Um, so it's really tough. I think book design and, and typesetting, right? Typesetting. What was your experience with typesetting, Jeff? I did not want to deal with it. I actually looked at getting set up with um, the Kindle publishing and they, there's tutorials walk you through. It's supposed it's supposed to be not hard, but I had fear, and I'm I'm pretty technically savvy, but I'm like I don't want to mess this up. I didn't want to. I had read some horror stories about you know you go live and it doesn't format correctly on someone's Kindle device, and ugh, I didn't want any of that. So um, so I did hire someone to do all of that for me, and and they did a good job. They also told me, Jeff, you may publish it, and we'll still find errors, or someone will tell you there's a problem. Don't worry, we'll take care of the you know fix and republish process, which they did, um, and made that all smooth. So, I think there's something of note in here. You, you're probably getting the impression, but you can do stuff on your own. But there definitely are elements where you want to hire someone. So do factor that in. There's a cost um, yeah. to to creating a book and putting it out. For me, it wasn't about sales. It was about creating more of a business card, um, bolstering my reputation, and it's done that. Um, so just side note for folks. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, it, seriously, the best typesetting experience I had was with Change Leader because by that stage there was a platform which looked exactly like a blogging platform. So I was really familiar with the, you know, the way that you actually format a blog. Um, it meant that you could PDF chapters, print them off, look at them, go actually, no, I want to change that. So it gave you so much speed to laying your own content out. You could make in the moment decisions and go, do you know what? That sentence doesn't add value. Let's pull it out. It's going to take us over a page. Right. Um, whereas working with typesetters that you pay is incredibly painful. It will go back eight to 10 times. They send you the next version. You've got to keep proofreading to see what have they missed? What have they, you know, um, there seems to be a lot of lack of attention to detail in typesetters, which is really um, problematic. Um, but it's also probably the nature of the work they do, right? Um, I think when you're, and this probably speaks to the mindset of when you're publishing a book, I always say, and I don't have children, but I think what I'm seeing is when you've got multiple books, it's probably like having multiple children. Your first book, you fuss over, everything has to be perfect. You're reading obsessively on every aspect of the process. Um, you are so invested in it. The launch is, you know, this is your baby that you're introducing to the world and it's got to be perfect. By the time you get to the third one, it's like, there's the fridge, help yourself to the milk. Um, <laughs> you know, you just, yeah. Yeah. it, it, it it gets really um you loosen up with the process um but um yeah uh, absolutely and i always use the metaphor of um the little red caboose and so for those who are familiar with the childhood um rhyme around it you know so, or the story the little red caboose who thinks he can who thinks he can he thinks he can i know i can i know i can and publish when you get into publishing it is a little red caboose territory every day you're just on this uphill climb. Yeah, yeah. I, it, it's interesting. I was the one pushing the process at that point. So yes, there was a desire to do multiple editing cycles. And actually he said, at this point, I don't think we're adding any value. The editing is so good that going through it one more time is, is not going to appreciably improve this book. Let's stop. Um, and they, I'm the customer, so they took that advice. Um, they said, I think, you know, we'll be ready to publish in May. I said, why not start of March? And then they worked it back. Like, are you sure? Yeah, well, we've done all these things. So what's in the way? Um, I'm the customer. So that's another advantage of self-publishing. You can take control of that process. I think yeah. also worth throwing out, I did all my own uh, graphics within the book. I did them in PowerPoint. And um, because that gave you a crisp visual, um, they came back, said, uh, make sure you don't have anything that could be copyrightable. So if I had any clip art for something, out it went. I actually recreated some stuff myself. Um, we need this in black and white because your book's not in color. Okay, great. I did the recoloring. So there are some things, if you're savvy, you can do yourselves. And again, it saves you some cost too. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. It, I think, Natasha, you asked a question about referencing that also mm -hmm. plays to that, um, the concept. Um, it is best practice always to reference, reference somebody else's work or ideas. Um, there's different ways that you can do that. I think, you know, the most simplest way to do it is footnoting um, in a business textbook as opposed to APA or um, any of the, you know, the Harvard MLA kind of styles on that. Um, but I think always my advice is um, reference on the assumption that the person that you're writing about or their work that you're writing about is going to read your book. So you want to make sure that you have done them justice, um, yeah. that you are accurate um, and you're not too damning in your critique um, because they've been through that process as well. I did get releases um, from a number of people of stuff that I was sharing in Conversations of Change, just got them put in writing that they were comfortable with me and or I'd send them what I was planning of doing, particularly if I was using any of images of their IP. Um, so I think that's really good practice too, is to um, think about that. I pulled some stuff out because I wasn't confident I was going to get that approval um, or I didn't want to engage with that particular person. So right. I was like, okay, that's this is not the deal breaker like for the book. So there I is a the decision same to make. experience. Same thing. Yep. If there were pieces that I had referenced others and realized, oh, I'm going to have to jump through some hoops to get the approval. And I don't really yep. need it to make the point I'm making. So I just took it out. Yeah. 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 Um, so good question about referencing. We've got about 10 minutes left. Jeff, super curious about, because you're so fresh, talk to us about marketing. Yeah. And um, Catherine, saw you're asking about that as well. Um, so two roads, I think you do need to think about what does launch day look like and what are you going to do to promote it after that? Um, I did work to generate, and this is using, this is why blogs are helpful. You've got an audience already. I'm looking for people that will help me uh, drive attention to the book. You can engage them and ask them if they'll do things for you, and often they will. Um, I had webinars for the kickoff um, as well, and then I ended up hiring a, a PR firm to help me with this. Again, another expense but something I wanted to do. So I think uh, as of this morning, I finished recording my ninth guest podcast. Um, so people wanting to interview about the book, the process, what were some of your key insights? And then of course, I, I do use social media that goes into my, my uh, posting engine and that drives it onto LinkedIn in particularly regularly. So um, I did hire help to do that. I could have done more myself, but it would have been more challenging. And and I am working with clients and I'm time restricted. So so I did need the assistance there. So that's a bit about my journey. What about you? Yeah. Um, I think you need to be thinking about marketing pre-publishing, marketing at launch, marketing post-launch. And so really think about them as three separate campaigns. Um, I too had a brand marketing team uh, that was assisting. I think conversations have changed the firstborn child. It was big, right? So we, I shared a book launch with Lena Ross. That's how we came to, to start working together. We had 400 people in Melbourne at a rooftop bar. Um, it was crazy. We out-trended The Bachelor on Twitter. Like <laughs> we were just, it was over the top. It wasn't over the top, but it was a fantastic night. Um, but yeah, most of my marketing has always been through social media um, because I think, and, and again, I'm going to shout out to Trevor Young. He tells you build your community before you need them. And again, this is the benefit, what you referred to Jeff with your legacy of, of blog posting. We do have a community who supports us. They, they will be amazing, you know, when you launch your book. Um, they are so generous. Your people want you to succeed. So I think that's really important to hang on to. I had a lot of, you know, I had um, animated clips. I had this very subversive brown bag idea where you could purchase um, a copy of Conversations of Change. It would be wrapped in a brown paper bag and delivered anonymously to the person who really needs it, which I just thought was the bee's knees as a marketing idea. It was a little bit too subversive for most people. So that one failed. Um, 
but I think, you know, there's, there's so many different things you can do, but ultimately the best is going to be um, activating your community. Let them market for you. Um, you know, start grabbing their testimonials. Right. As people share right. on LinkedIn, beautiful. I, I keep a folder on my desktop, which is lovely things said about Jen, lovely things said about the Agile Change Leadership. As I see people say things in comments, I just take a snip and I plonk it into that folder for future use. Um, because this is the thing, your community is so generous. They say lovely things all the time. You can use them, right? You turn them right. into a tile. Get really close and friendly with Canva. Like Canva will be your friend in terms of in the moment social media artifacts um, if you don't have a team that's working with you. Yeah. I think yeah, it's good. We've both talking about we've both spoken about the resources. Um, did you have a budget? <laughs> no, actually. <laughs> and and I think partially because I, I didn't know what it was going to cost me. So just as things came up and said, oh, well, that makes sense as an investment in doing this right. So I'm going to make the investment. The PR part came that way of, you know, I realized I just didn't have capacity to do all the things I wanted to do to draw attention. I need help and I had a referral that that looks good for me. So I, I'm going to invest in that. So so no, I didn't have a budget. Yeah, I, I was the same. Um, that said, I didn't want to overcapitalize on it because, you know, they there's some there's various stats out there about self-publishing, right? And, you know, um, 10% never or the majority, 90% never sell more than 200 copies or right. that kind of thing. Right. What I did, though, was I set a goal was that I wanted um, my pre-sales to cover the cost of the production of the book. Mm. Um, and so I really was quite motivated from a marketing perspective to, you know, I had a kind of countdown. Once we got to this many, we've covered the cost of publishing the book. Um, so don't be worrying about profit because that's ridiculous. It's never going to happen. Um, right. But but just making sure that your costs are covered is a pretty useful goal, I think. Yeah, yeah, agreed. Yeah, and I, folks, there's not been a question, but I'm sure it's on people's minds. So, you know, how much are we talking? And I can't give you an accurate amount, but I know for me, um, the investments I made moved into the thousands it wasn't hundreds of dollars for me yeah. thousands um, by the time because the editing is labor um, designing book covers labor it all adds up very quickly especially if you've got professionals doing work for you yeah i i i agree i think i've it's been burnt from my brain how much it cost um but i would hazard a guess that it was probably i think about 15,000 in that kind of area. Um, probably I'd say five to 15,000 at various stages, like by the time you yep. add it all up. Yep, um, agreed. Definitely conversations have changed. Definitely was probably close to 15,000 um, because that's the one I went all out on, you know, with hiring everybody. So, so please do note Jen's previous comment. We don't publish books typically to make money. It's very difficult to do that. Um, it is about making an impact. It usually drives other work. I'm sure for you, Jen, probably workshops um, mm -hmm. as well. Totally. Yeah, yeah. For me, speaking engagements, it it definitely has helped drive consulting engagements. And it becomes a really good value add for your clients. Like when you um, when you they engage you to do workshops or consulting or something and you say and of course that includes 200 copies of conversations of change for your people um that blows their mind that is like the the you know particularly particularly a tangible hard copy book um as opposed to an ebook there's so much value attached to that so yeah. it's a really easy way to delight people uh, Mirabon's asked a good question. I know we're, we're closing on the end of things, folks, but um, yeah, great question. Getting that first draft done and then figuring out the other steps. That's fair and actually mirrors what I did. There is some risk in that as well. Um, and that is depending on which way you go, let's say you do want to run it by a publisher. You shouldn't write it first because they may have feedback for you around what we're looking for is actually more of this, less of that. So keep that in mind in terms of uh, what is your 
your goal and who's your target audience and who do you want to publish it? So that's one thing to keep in mind. Jen, any comments on that? Yeah, I, I think so. It's kind of like there's iterations, right? So I, I think you can go a high level first draft and that would help you in your pitch because you may not know what, what it, if, if you actually would do a pitch to a publisher, maybe you've actually, um, there's the E.M. Forster quote, right? How do I know what I think until I see it? And this is another benefit of writing a book is it gets you, it gives you the opportunity to clarify your thinking and your intellectual property and your thought leadership, if we're going to use that term. Um, writing the book makes you really concrete on that. And so sometimes you actually have to write the first draft to know what you want to pitch to a publisher. Yep, um, yep, that's fair. Things and roundabouts. There's a question about audiobooks. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't plan to do an audiobook because it was just another cost um, and I was tired. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say that's it. Like you're, you're so happy to just get the stupid thing out the door. Um, and then what? You want me to go back into a studio and then wear my voice out talking. Um, I've, I've had a couple requests for an audio version of my book. Yeah. I have to say it's just not priority for me. And the numbers don't make sense based on my sales for me at this sense. point. Yeah, they, uh, it, it, it's a cost that's not, you know, is not going to add value to what you've already achieved from the benefits. I did, um, I did try, I, on my podcast, I released the first five chapters. So I actually read the first five chapters on, as episodes on my podcast to kind of test the water and go, yeah, okay, good. did I get feedback out of that? Was that valuable? And not nah, crickets. So, um, <laughs> Like, well, why would I read the whole thing? Jesus. Um, right. So, yeah, it's, um, but all power to you. If that's your thing, do it, you know. Yeah. I think we've hit on all the questions. We're, we're <laughs> at the hour. Um, folks, if you have more questions, feel free to drop them in the chat and, and Jen and I can respond or send one of us a note. Uh, we'd be happy to do that. Um, I'll make sure this recording gets sent out to everyone that did register. If you want to listen to it again, by all means. And um, uh, for me, I'll post in the chat as well. You're welcome um, to go to my website, take anything you want. You can get a sense of my writing. I'm sure same for Jen as well, um, by all means. Jen, anything you want to add? No, um, it's just been incredibly therapeutic and cathartic to have this conversation. Yes. So, Jeff, thank you so much for inviting me into this and, and thanks for the questions. Hit us up on LinkedIn if you've got anything further and in about a week's time we'll publish an article which addresses these and anything else that comes up. Um, yeah. But have a fabulous day for those who are starting it and a lovely evening for those who are ending it. Yeah, ditto for me. See you, folks. Bye for now. Bye. Now you can stop recording, Jeff. <laughs>